This will be an unusual video. It's not a classical law video, but we will also have a look at law at the end. Today we will talk about the canon. Not those canons, but the canon of Tolkien's universe. I always wanted to make a video like this because I think it's necessary to discuss this problem for my channel and I sometimes get lengthy posts about my view on this topic in context of my videos. So what does canon mean? The word was, to my knowledge, originally used for the Bible and it's the official, so by the church's view of which religious books are part of the Bible and which are not. Books that are not part of the official Bible canon are called apocrypha, but the term in its historical context is a bit more complicated than this, but for this video I probably use it simplified as the opposite of canon. Also in fiction, fantasy, science fiction and so on, the term canon is often used to say this book or story is officially part of the fictional main story or universe and today, in newer works, it has also become easier to determine what's canon. However, there are also many works that are relevant today too, where canon is a problem. Tolkien's works are one of them. I will give you some examples later in the video, but I want to discuss several aspects of the concept of canon first. In case you don't find it interesting, I can spoil the end here already. There is no real canon outside of The Lord of the Rings and the second edition of The Hobbit in my opinion. The why is however a more interesting question than the actual answer. I also want to hint at a few things first. Spoiler warning, I tried to pronounce names as Tolkien described it and shoutouts to Kimberly80 for allowing me to use her artworks. Canon in fiction and creating stories is, in my opinion, a relatively new phenomenon. New at least compared to, for example, religious texts. One of many reasons for this is that in the past relatively few sequel or prequel stories were written compared to what we see today. If you only write one book and then your next book is a whole new story in a whole new universe, there's no need for canon because you only have one book. This slowly changed during the last 200 years, I guess, and peaks in our present where everything is a franchise and needs multiple entries. In my opinion, one of the reasons is a side effect of extending copyright protection times far over the lifetime of the author in most parts of the world. You know my opinion on that. Especially this circumstance that works and franchises are protected far over the lifetime of the original creator makes defining a canon probably necessary. But not only that, I also think it has to do with for example our era among some other things. We live in a time where humans truly mastered the art of information preservation. There's the saying the internet never forgets and indeed it can become almost impossible to get unwanted information out of it again, at least when the information has a certain interest. When an ancient library was destroyed, for example by a fire, then its knowledge was potentially lost forever if no copies of the books and writings in it existed. Today we have almost everything stored redundantly to prevent this thanks to digitization. From my perspective we all became information collectors. We store for example tons of our photos, our messages, have access to huge collections of films, books, video games and other media. The spirit of our time, the Zeitgeist as we would call it in Germany, probably pushed us to bring the flood of information and stories we encounter every day in some kind of order and with this we also have not only a need but also a desire for a canon too because canon brings a form of order. But canon can be a fragile thing. Not only that, it can also become very individual. One of the first anime I watched that showed me as a teenager that anime can be a bit more than those funny cartoon series I watched in the afternoon when I came home from school and which were great too, were the record of Lodos War OVAs and Neon Genesis Evangelion, later also Ghost in the Shell, Akira and so on. OVA by the way means basically produced for home video and not for TV and stands for original video animation. 
In both cases, Record of Lodos War and NGE can and can be debated. In the case of Lodos War, for me personally, only the original video animation 1 and 2 are canon. The later produced TV series ignores the last three, I think, episodes of the second OVA from the early 90s. And the ending is totally different, so both are not compatible and contradict each other, but I like the OVA ending more by far. But this is just my view, not an official one and other fans may probably have a different opinion. Another personal example would be Final Fantasy VII. Together with the first Deus Ex from 2000, my favorite game of all time. For me personally, the games and the film that came after it are not canon. It's likely that some fans and even Square Enix as creator company sees this differently, but I don't care. And I'm not the only one who has this view, especially when it comes to the film. But of course, there are others who for example like the games. Of course, this stretches the concept of canon quite a bit, because in its original meaning it's the official view of those with authority over the work. But still, there is nothing absolute in the official canon either. When Disney bought Star Wars, they changed the canon a bit. This happened in other franchises too. Suddenly some books and stories are no longer considered canon by the owners because the owners changed, creators changed their minds or wrote the story into a dead end and so on. In this we see how an individual canon or one of a smaller fan group can become important too because changing the existing one can lead to frustration among people who cared about it and create the need for an alternative, especially when your favorite story arc suddenly is not canon anymore. And here lie several important points. Communication and an interesting observation of the concept of truth. In our time we are not only collectors of information, but also obsessed with communicating with each other. In this very moment I present you my thoughts and you can reply to them in for example the comment section, in a tweet, an email, etc. We are communicating. Just by deciding to click on my video, we already communicated in my opinion. I know you found it interesting enough to click on it and you knew after watching, hopefully, what my thoughts are. If we talk about a fictional universe, which happens most of the time on my channel, a canon helps communicating because we both know what we are talking about. It's a foundation we can base our conversation on. With it, we agree on a collection of stories, texts or truths that complement each other and form a mostly consistent universe that largely avoids contradictions. Our theories and ideas we discuss are based on the same foundation that helps a lot. But as explained, canon can be fragile, can even be changed for reasons and in some works like Tolkien's there's also no consensus on the canon of Tolkien's later writings and never will be. It's interesting that absolute truth in a philosophical sense might not really exist or is simply out of reach for us. And it seems that even in published fiction this problem might be reflected to some degree. A stupid example regarding truth and reality. Your and my eyes are slightly different. They have for example a bit more or a bit less photoreceptor cells. Especially between women and men there's a difference because the genes for those cells are on the X chromosome and since women have two X chromosomes which are also slightly different their color perception for red and orange is more precise. As far as I know that's also part of the reason why red green color blindness is rarer for women. So they might see color differences men can't see. However, in this we see that even a simple part of our reality like seeing colors which are specific wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation can be interpreted slightly different from human to human. So what's the absolute truth now? Your perception or mine? Probably only the exact wavelength and it can be determined very precisely but not absolute too. However, that is not a problem on our macroscopic existence. We can still agree on a color and we are able to abstract. But I think it's an interesting thought that the world through the eyes of someone else can look a bit different. Interestingly, it seems that even in fiction we can partially observe this fundamental problem of 
absolute truth. One should think that if a human creates fiction and writes it down, that it must be absolute true and never change. But then, for example, after 35 years, a creator sells his rights and the new owner company simply changes details. Even George Lucas did implement small changes to his Star Wars films after they were released and he still owned the rights. There are also many other films where several different cuts exist, like for example Blade Runner. Also for The Lord of the Rings we have the theatrical cuts and the extended editions which explain many parts of the story in far more detail. Suddenly the perception of an idea can drastically change, especially for new generations of readers or viewers, where the original version becomes less known over time. We are creatures of change, which is also something that Tolkien portrays well in his books. To finally come back to Tolkien, here another example. The Hobbit in its first edition from 1937 and the second edition from 1951 comes to my mind, even though the intention of the change is probably very different from the examples I mentioned before. For instance, in the chapter Riddles in the Dark, where Bilbo and Gollum play their little riddle game, Tolkien changed a few things to make it compatible with The Lord of the Rings, the sequel he was working on. Originally, Gollum bets his magical ring freely and can't find it because he lost it, so Bilbo, who found the ring before, suggests that Gollum shows him the exit instead. In the second edition it's a bit different as we know. The outcome is the same but a quite interesting change. Here we have also a clear intention, a thought and a message by the creator telling us what's canon. Tolkien even references this change in The Lord of the Rings by making Bilbo not write the true story in his red book and not telling the others because of the influence of the One Ring. A very neat idea by Tolkien. I explain this in a bit more detail in episode 4 of my films and books differences series if you are interested. Tolkien wanted to create mythology and I think canon in mythology is something that barely exists at all. Mythology developed over time and maybe changed a bit in later traditions because it was not really created by just one person or a company. Myths are stories that were told to the next generation. Only when people started writing them down they probably became more consistent, you would think. But even here we find different details in different versions depending on who wrote it down and when it was written down. Sometimes we can even find several different versions of the same character in the same source. Helgi from the Norse mythology comes to my mind. You can of course somehow connect the three versions from the Poetic Edda, but you can also see it as three versions of the same story. In some cases we also have something like fan fiction, for example, what would happen if those mythological heroes would fight each other? In these ancient times copyright was handled differently and there were no companies who owned mythology. In this regard we have many stories that tell vastly different origin stories of the same characters. Which one is now canon? All and none. In this we also have some parallels to Tolkien's works. We have two versions of The Hobbit. We have the Silmarillion which was completed after Tolkien's death by his son Christopher Tolkien who also was his editor. We have The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien however at least tried to solve those canon problems a bit and he tried to be consistent. He made the necessary changes to The Hobbit so it would fit better to The Lord of the Rings and as mentioned even delivered an explanation for the existence of the first edition which is also still available for purchase. You could ask now what's the problem when The Hobbit's second edition does fit to the rest? The Silmarillion, which tells the stories of Tolkien's mythology that ultimately lead to the events of the Lord of the Rings. This book gives the world even more depth and makes the Lord of the Rings really special. Christopher Tolkien had to work with what he knew at the time, without having all texts and piece all the stories somehow together so that it complemented the Lord of the Rings and formed a consistent world and connected narrative. However, for this he also had to make a selection of all the available stories his father wrote and those often existed in different versions too. John Ronald Rule Tolkien worked even on some drastic changes in the background which the Silmarillion we know totally ignores. 
and in addition some parts were simply missing so Christopher Tolkien had to add those. Now you might ask, how do we know what was missing and how do we know what was in those unpublished texts? Christopher Tolkien published them all in for example the 12 History of Middle-earth books. He also comments on the stories, the creation of the books and his own decisions. And he is of course fully aware that the Silmarillion of his father would have been a very different book if he had ever finished it. This puts the Silmarillion into a very tough spot if you are looking for canonical truth because there is none from his father's perspective so to say. The task of creating the Silmarillion was immensely difficult and Christopher Tolkien would not have written 12 books about it if he wasn't absolutely loyal to his father's vision and really trying. He did this because he really cares but as a creator myself I know that a publication is pretty much always the best possible result under the given circumstances and with the time available, especially if tons of work went into it, even if the publication has some small mistakes. So nobody hates Christopher Tolkien for the Silmarillion, but after reading through all the history of Middle-earth books you will see that the Silmarillion can be quite debatable. Some people will definitely disagree here but after reading the history of Middle-earth books I come to the conclusion that there is no canon beyond The Lord of the Rings and the second edition of The Hobbit. The notes and drafts published in the history of Middle-earth books, unfinished tales and so on are often simply not ready for a publication. They are work in progress. Also Tolkien changed his mind on many details or struggled with others. The origin of the orcs went through a ton of iterations and the final words of Tolkien need a relatively radical rewriting of big parts of the law and also many additions. For example, men have to awake shortly after the elves for his latest decision on the matter. What were they doing all the time? Of course we get some hints through the tale of Adanel and in Andres dialogue with Galadriel's brother Finrod but this is while very interesting in my opinion still not enough to fill all the gaps and solve all the problems. There's also the so-called round world version where Tolkien worked on a version of his mythology where the world was always round, sun and moon always existed and the law, telling things different, was just a legend from a certain perspective. He seems to have abandoned this idea later again but still some people might find this idea very intriguing and wished for it to be canon. We have the legend of the three fathers of the elves and the 141 other so called unbegotten elves who were not born because they were the first and just there. The Silmarillion ignores this tale completely and I'm also not the hugest fan of it to be honest so I'm quite happy about it missing but that's just my opinion. These are just some famous examples of many. Some even say that the history of Middle-earth books are canon and the Silmarillion should be ignored but most of the history of Middle-earth books can't be understood without the Silmarillion and we encounter potential contradictions with the Lord of the Rings if we just would take the latest writings of Tolkien. Of course in a sense these 12 books plus unfinished tales are the most true books because they show us what was going on in the background and what Tolkien worked on. But the existence of several versions of the same text alone makes forming a canon difficult. I also have written newer versions of texts and used an older one instead because I thought it was better or returned to an old idea. Maybe Tolkien had in addition an idea for even another version but never wrote it down. There are just so many possibilities and unknown factors here that I can't say what's canon of it. No Nobody can except Tolkien himself but he died almost 46 years ago and with this we probably need to accept the fact that there is no canon which also reflects mythology. If we now come back from the concept of truth to communication and telling stories, I will say that a canon can be needed though. Often on this channel I tell a story, I explain the law but to do so I need consistency, I need a foundation on which I can build and structure my videos on. In the medium video I don't always have the time to build a 5 minute explanation discussing 5 different versions of the same text for every simple statement I need to make always coming to the conclusion that we don't know what's canon. 
it would be a nightmare to structure and increase the length of my already often very long videos even further. It would also be potentially very confusing. Discussing these details is only possible in very dedicated videos where I only discuss one text but in a video like my Sauron or History of the Elves video this is simply impossible for me. So I have to find a foundation or a canon for this else I can't tell you any story or reference outside of The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. And the only book that delivers a somewhat consistent narrative that is also compatible with Tolkien's main works and is widely known is The Silmarillion. It was made to fit to The Lord of the Rings. It's also the book you need to know before you read the History of Middle-earth books. In most reading order recommendations it will be listed third or maybe fourth but the History of Middle-earth books will be always last on that list. The Silmarillion is also as mentioned wider spread than the other later books so it's more likely for people coming to my channel to have heard of it or even read it. With this it qualifies as a solid foundation for the videos I and other Tolkien content creators make. In conclusion for me as a video creator it makes totally sense to use it as a foundation minus some mistakes in it like for example Gilgalad's parents. So for this channel my foundation is always The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings including its appendices, The Silmarillion, Tolkien's letters and maybe The Children of Húrin, one of the great tales. And if something is missing there or there's a mistake I will add or correct it with what I know from the letters and even here you can debate the canon, unfinished tales, Beren and Luthien, The Fall of Gondolin and The History of Middle-earth books in this order. The three main books plus letters are my foundation or personal canon for the sake of making consistent law videos. I would in certain cases also include the children of Húrin. The other books however are my apocrypha, good to read, I will use them to correct mistakes, inconsistencies or take information out of them that is not in my canon books and does also not contradict them except for mistakes of course. And people who watch my videos probably know how carefully or vague I word elements and that I often tend to hint at the history of Middle-earth books too. Sometimes I have to take shortcuts because it would not fit the structure and make things too confusing to follow. I don't make my videos for Tolkien scholars more knowledgeable than I am or with the intention to meet academic standards but for people who are interested to dive deeper into the law giving a good overview. I personally know that there is no true canon but I need some something like it for what I do. So always take what I say with a grain of salt. It's just my perspective. Another thing is that I want to encourage people to read the books themselves and form their own opinion. Of course watching my videos can help reading through the tougher books and I'm happy to often get positive feedback here. Also don't get me wrong, I really try to cover the history of Middle-earth books as well and I try to tell you what's in the books but sometimes it's simply not possible to fit all details into a needed structure or the content is too complex and would derail the video into a totally new direction that would be quite similar if I would for example cover ancient mythology instead of Tolkien's. Every explanation needs time in a video and in production as well. Time rules over my medium and it knows no mercy. Thank you for watching. I felt the need to make a video like this and talk about my canon. It's usually reflected by the list of sources I show at the beginning of a video but even if you see a History of Middle-earth book on it, it does not mean I take every detail. But I also think some people are not even aware of how much debate there is among Tolkien fans. Again, a difficult topic and I hope you liked this somewhat unusual video. I had a hard time making it because it's summer and unusually warm in Germany, thanks to the climate change caused by men. As a result, I could have made more little mistakes than usual. In case you liked this video feel free to press the like button, write a comment or maybe consider subscribing. If you do and want notifications you can press the annoying bell. Also if you are looking for more in-depth Tolkien related law videos check my channel. I can recommend my books and films differences and references series. The playlist is in the description. I also made a video about necromancy in Tolkien's universe or the languages.
Next video will be again Tolkien related because it's so warm I think about making something shorter. I thought about a beginner's guide to Tolkien's universe which is probably something my more experienced viewers don't need but it could still be useful for people new to Tolkien's works or even the films. However, Amazon just announced some news about their upcoming Lord of the Rings related series and I will definitely look into this. So I think that's what's next. Again, thank you for watching and goodbye.